Well, good afternoon or good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to the webinar today on community development and public health. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Michael Swack. I'm the director of the master's program in community development and also director of our Center for Impact Finance. And uh, I'll be joined today by Rosemary Karen in just a few minutes, who's a professor of public health and uh, a longtime instructor in our master's program in community development, who will be teaching uh, a course this summer online on uh, uh, the links between community development and public health. And we'll have a chance to talk to her a little bit about uh, that course and some of her thinking about uh, particularly in the environment we are operating in today, the importance of that connection. Uh, we have a chat room open today for questions that you have, so please feel free to use the chat room. We also have a QA. and uh, a You can use that as well. Uh, my colleague, Robin Husledge, has also joined us, and she'll be checking the chat room and the, the Q&A, so feel free to jump in. We're going to start with about a 15-minute overview of the master's program in community development, and then we'll move to uh, a discussion and an interview with, uh, with Rosemary. So thanks for joining us. A uh, little bit about uh, the Carsey School of Public Policy. Uh, the Carsey School has a range of academic programs of which we'll focus on the Masters in Community Development today. It has a range of uh, research centers and centers that are involved in engagement in the community. Uh, a lot of research goes on at the Carsey School. And we also have a, an outreach program called New Hampshire Listens, which is a a civic engagement initiative that operates throughout the state. Uh, CARSI offers three academic programs in addition to the Master's in Community Development, which I'll be talking about. We have a Master's in Public Administration and a Master's in Public Policy. Uh, the Master's in Community Development uh, is now an, an all online program and we use a cohort model. In the past, we had a, a short-term residency program on campus of, of two weeks, uh, but now the program is offered entirely online. Uh, we use a cohort model, which means that you start and finish with the same people and typically take uh, many of the same classes, all the required classes together. You work together in groups, and uh, these are people who you'll get to know very well over the 14 or so months of the program. Uh, the program is characterized by a capstone project, which is a project you do in your own community, often in your own workplace, that's accompanied by a four-course sequence. I'll talk about that in a minute. And a set of uh, core courses in management, finance, uh, public policy, and community economic development. And then, as you'll see, a range of elective courses as well. Uh, some of the elective courses are listed at the bottom there, including the we list the community medicine and epidemiology and the global health courses, both courses that Rosemary teaches. You also see the four course project sequence that I mentioned just a minute ago uh, that starts with an introduction to the project and you carry out your project in your community as well as taking this sequence of courses. The capstone project is really the, the core of the program and this is a project that you develop uh, one of the frequent questions we, we get is, do I have to have a project uh, before I start the program? And the answer is no. Much of the first term is spent thinking about the project and what you might do. And we really encourage people to carry out a project, whether it's within their organization or outside, that focuses on something they really want to learn, something they really want to do, and something that they want to spend uh, 14 months on in terms of actually putting together the project, doing some of the planning for the project, implementation and developing an evaluation plan for the project. And as we'll see, there've been a, a number of projects. Uh, I'm gonna skip Nisha for now. Uh, we've had a number of projects in, in a number of countries. I uh, wanna just mention that one of the really interesting parts of the program and the cohort is the diversity of students who come to the program. Uh, people from around the world, from all over the United States, uh, people in uh, many uh, a great deal of diversity in terms of age, ethnic diversity, uh, uh, people from uh, all sorts of experiential backgrounds. And this is a real strength of the program, the ability to listen to, learn from, 
and contribute to uh, a discussion that involves people from really all over and all different experience levels, and each of them involved in, in projects all over. To apply for the program, it's a, a 36 credit program. There are nine core courses, which includes the project courses, the experiential project courses. Uh, uh, like we said, it's uh, career focused. Uh, many employers uh, provide some assistance, uh, uh, financial assistance, because in fact, you're doing work for the organization if you do your project there. Uh, you'll also work closely with uh, faculty advisors who will provide assistance in the program. And also, one of the things we mentioned is that we have a lot of connections and offer post-graduation career support. And some people enter the program in, a, in an established organization with the intention of staying there. Other people enter the program where they don't have a community development background but want to move into that field and look at the degree program as a way of enhancing their ability to move into a community development career. Uh, the program, as we mentioned, is, is uh, all online. Uh, it can be completed in as little as 14 months or spread out depending on how many courses you want to take at any given time. Uh, there are two summer terms, that is two five-week terms in the summer where you take courses between June, June and August. And then there are online terms in spring and fall where you typically take uh, two courses. Although again, uh, you can take fewer courses if you want and spread out the degree program over a longer period of time. I'll talk about the cost in a minute, but the, the cost is by course, so it's not any more expensive to uh, take the course over a longer period of time if you choose. Uh, it's fully online or hybrid. It says the hybrid is the program that we offer the short-term residency. Uh, we're not doing that now. We, we may reinstitute a short-term residency component to the program, uh, but anyone who starts and wants to complete the program fully online will be able to do that. Uh, the cohorts typically start in the summer term, so we start uh, the summer term the first week in June. Uh, we're still accepting applications for this year up until May 1st, and you can apply by filing an application online, uh, although uh, we still accept some of your materials like transcripts if they come in later. Also, we do have people who, will, who start the program uh, on occasion in the fall or spring term by taking uh, an elective or a required course, uh, taking one course to see what it's like beforehand, and then join a cohort when they uh, get to the summer term. As you see here, uh, this coming summer, uh, there's an orientation uh, that begins on June 5th. Classes start on the 8th. Uh, you'll see in the blue is the first five-week term, and the green is the second five-week term. And uh, again, you take a variety of courses uh, for first-year students, you start with the Integrative Approaches course. Uh, that's a course that I uh, co-teach with uh, my colleague, Lee Farrow. And uh, there are also courses in uh, organizational management first-year students take, as well as your project course. Again, this is an outline of some of the courses you would also take then in the fall and spring term. I'm going to move through this quickly. This is also available online. The application requirements are the actual application that you submit online, and then uh, your transcript of your bachelor's degree, three letters of reference, a personal statement, uh, a resume, an application fee. We don't require GREs. A TOEFL exam is re required for international students only if you have never studied in English before. The cost of the program you see on the screen there. Uh, that's the cost for the entire program, all four terms, or for however long it takes you to get through the program, the, the per course cost. Uh, we offer a range of uh, financial aid, including grant funds to uh, all students who are eligible. And uh, in addition, uh, the organizations that you see on the bottom are all partners with us and offer additional financial aid through the partnership we have with those organizations. And again, any one of us can give you more information about, uh, about the financial aid. Uh, as I mentioned before, graduates in the program work in a wide range of fields. You see they're from nonprofit and community-based organizations, government organizations, consulting uh, groups, uh, really a full range. 
this is just uh, three recent uh, graduates and uh, some of the work that they do, uh, including uh, Jessica, who works, uh, Rosemary, you may remember her, who works now with Dartmouth Hitchcock as a project manager, but people work in microfinance, uh, like Andrew did, in affordable housing, in consulting, and uh, a whole range of uh, community development related fields. So, Rosemary, that brings us to us. And again, this is uh, Rosemary Karen, who's a professor in, at the UNH Health Management and Policy and teaches uh, public health in our program. And, and uh, really, one of our very popular instructors, Rosemary, you've been with us really since the program started almost 10 years ago. And, and I know that uh, students really love your course. And, and, and uh, boy, if it's ever topical, it's, it's right now that it is. Um, so let me start by just asking you, Rosemary, um, how do community development and, and public health, where do they come together? Why, why is it so important that when we think about community development, we think about public health as well? So um, first of all, thank you, Michael, um, for arranging this session today. Um, I'll just uh, share with those who are participating and who may watch later um, that this is a very special program. I've always said that. I think it's a very important program because it allows you to not only gain the knowledge to be able to improve the health, well-being, and overall development of our community, but it also allows you to practice those skills. So you really walk the talk in this program, and I think that's a real strength. Um, so to your question about the relationship between community development and community health, so community health, we could also call that public health, where that differs from healthcare in that in healthcare, the individual is the patient. In community health or public health, it's the population, it's the community that you're trying to work with to improve the overall well-being of the people who live in that community. And so if there were two disciplines that could be better integrated, I can't think of them. I, I think in order to have a well-functioning community, you need to, at some level, one of the factors that needs to be addressed is the health status of the residents who live there. And community so, health allows you to do that. So how, how do we do that? How, how do you begin to assess and study the health of the community? I know one of the frustrations, and I've talked to a lot of alumni over the past couple of weeks, is, is this feeling like, just like everything else, it's the lower income and poorer communities who are suffering the brunt of the coronavirus uh, epidemic right now. I want to talk a little bit about how we might assess uh, the, the health of the community, and, and, and what are some of the strategies you're seeing in terms of really trying to uh, address the concerns that people have about you know, who's taking the brunt of this? Sure, sure. Um, and unfortunately, uh, because we're in the midst of a global pandemic and we're hearing and learning about at-risk populations really bearing the brunt um, with coronavirus in particular, that's been the case before the pandemic as well. And so, um, this field of community health or public health, the mission of public health is to prevent disease, promote health, and protect the health of populations. That's really easy to say. It's really tough work to achieve that mission. And one of the tools that we use to do that is a bit of a mouthful. It's called epidemiology. And epidemiology is the basic science of public health. So that's where we get the skills to be able to assess the health of a community and its population. So for example, you're hearing on the evening news about um, mortality rates and um, infection and how transmissible uh, COVID-19 is. And so those are the issues that we study from a population perspective, whether it be an infectious illness like we're all um, dealing with today, or it could be um, a chronic disease that's occurring in a community or um, an injury that might be occurring at a, in an at-work environment. So epidemiology allows us the skills to assess the health of community. And we even have a um, uh, an activity, a function that we do within epidemiology called community health assessment. 
in which there is a very descriptive way by which we will analyze the health of a community. And um, we learn about that in, in this course that I teach in the program, uh, community, community Medicine and Epidemiology. We, we try to, um, at a very rudimentary level, try to look at that and understand what are some of the factors you would want to look at if asked is this community healthy or not? And where are those struggles and what to do about them? Um, it's very much a team sport, uh, public health. It is uh, work that you don't do in a silo by any means. It requires uh, partnerships, uh, collaborations at every level to be able to do this work. Can you give a few examples, Rosemary, of, of what you've seen that are effective community-based approaches to addressing public health problems? and, and Sure. Know, they've worked? Sure, sure. Um, so I'll, the, I'll give two examples, if I may. The, the first is a very local uh, work that I've been involved in for many years is, is looking at childhood lead poisoning in an at-risk population, specifically African refugees within the city of Manchester, New Hampshire. And how can we protect these at-risk populations um, in order to protect people from experiencing um, something that is quite preventable, you have to really understand uh, what are the barriers that are involved. And so um, Manchester is very fortunate in that it is the home of uh, one of the largest, the largest local health department in the state of New Hampshire. And they have been working on this issue from day one. Um, so again, many partners, many stakeholders, including those that live with these issues, that's a very important point that when you're trying to address an issue in a community, um, you should not just go into the community and think you have all the answers. You actually need to work with the people who are living with the issue day in and day out. And we've seen that take shape in, in Manchester, um, where folks who have children poisoned by lead were able to have discussions around why is that? Why, what, where is the housing? What is the quality of that housing? How can we engage in preventive measures? Um, so that's just one very local example. There are many examples here in New Hampshire. Um, but if I look to our south, to Massachusetts, there's also uh, numerous examples there. Um, states have different public health infrastructures, so that's important to keep in mind. And Manchester has a very, excuse me, Massachusetts has a very different public health infrastructure than the state of New Hampshire. And they've been able to work on issues. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about a program in Somerville, Massachusetts called uh, Shape Up Somerville. Uh, that's been very effective in trying to increase activity and reduce obesity amongst the, the school age population. And again, it takes a village to do this work. So although the data was showing them there was an issue, it's not just one organization's responsibility to solve that problem. So they've partnered very extensively and very well in Somerville to, to, to bring those, those numbers down. Rosemary, let me ask you a question about a term that's become common, and then I'll, I also want to give an example that you reminded me of. But uh, a term that's been used in public health for a long time and it has now become more popular in community development is the whole concept of social determinants of health. Yes. Can yes. you talk a little bit about what the social determinants of health are and, and really how does that factor into the broader equation of understanding health? Oh, great question. Um, the social determinants of health, in, in my opinion, is one of the pillars of public health and community health. So a determinant of health is any factor or event that brings about a change in one's health. When you add that word social, it's now our, our living situation, our living environment. So that's everything from your housing, the quality of where you live. Um, to your education status, to whether you have employment, to whether you have access to health care, um, to the built or, um, and or physical environment in which we live. So it's really all of those factors affect our health. And that's been an area that's been studied um, extensively in public health. And as I say, it's one of the pillars when we look about trying to fulfill the mission of public health, which again is to prevent disease, promote health, and protect the health of population. You have to see where people live. You can't just wait until they're showing up in a hospital or an emergency room. And we call that the upstream factors. Um, so what are, what are those factors that affect your health um, that could ultimately contribute to 
um, disease, injury, or illness, and and working there, really working upstream of those of those events. Yeah. So let me give you a, a fascinating example, a part of a project that uh, that we participated in, and then I want to ask you a little bit about your course, uh, sure. Summer. Uh, the social determinants we brought together about five years ago a, a group of hospital uh, people who work with hospital systems, uh, who both community health, but also the uh, chief financial officers of, of, of hospitals. Mm-hmm. And we brought them together with community organizations, including community development financial institutions. And they all sat at the same table. That is, you applied as a community. One of the things that was fascinating, this was hosted by the Boston Federal Reserve and two other Federal Reserves, was that um, many of the people had never met each other before, mm-hmm. even worked in the same communities. Well, one of the tables was a group of people from Vermont, including uh, the mm-hmm. chief medical officer of University of Vermont hospital system. And he talked about the difficulty they had uh, uh, in terms of meeting community needs. Mm-hmm. And they talked about doing a, a geocoding. They mm-hmm. actually were beginning geocoding of where did their most expensive patients live? Mm-hmm. Discovered, not surprisingly, is that it was in the poorest uh, zip codes right. in Burlington, Vermont. And what emerged in studying that further was that there was a pattern that was very similar among mm-hmm. all their patients. They generally had some sort of chronic illness, didn't have a doctor or, or in many instances have any sort of medical insurance. And so they would wait until they got really sick and then ended up mm-hmm. in an ambulance in the emergency room, which is the most expensive. Right. And And then they would be kept in the hospital for four or five days and then released because you're not allowed to keep someone uh, beyond the time where they've, you know, reached a certain level of uh, health and ability. And so they would go back to the exact same situation, Mm -hmm. you know, four months later, they would return. Mm -hmm. And found was, well, maybe we can find a better solution than just releasing them back in the community. So they worked with the public health department and they worked with the local nonprofit housing provider. Mm -hmm. actually bought uh, a couple motels, converted them into housing for people to kind of put a nursing station right in uh, the the housing where where they could monitor them. And then also partnered with the local uh, Department of of Labor and Job Placement because many of the people actually wanted to work and could work even if it was just part-time. In the first year, Mm what found was not only they saved over a million dollars in the first year in hospital costs and achieved better health outcomes. I mean, people were now getting treatment and and medication and it costs a lot less than if you, you know, the alternative where they ended up in the emergency room. So, I mean, that was the one where they've developed a housing first approach now and bring in other services and found better outcomes. And so I thought that was a really interesting example of how social determinants felt. Yes, I mean, there are other determinants of health, like can you see a doctor? <laughs> right, exactly, yeah, That's yeah. also yeah. a determinant of, of yeah. so, yeah. Uh, so it, it again showed the connection between when you get community development organizations working together with health organizations, you often come up with better solutions. That's right, and um, I, I'm very familiar with that example, Michael, mm-hmm. and actually use it in the community medicine and epidemiology course. So I'm really delighted you brought that mm-hmm. up. And um, it is a model. That is a, a beautiful example of how the community um, development, healthcare, and public health all came together to to develop a very feasible solution. A lot of these problems don't require um, immense amounts of money. I think they require immense amounts of willpower and interest and desire to solve these problems. And um, that's been a really beautiful model that I hope we'll see replicated in more communities across the country. So Rosemary, talk about your course a little bit. What are the sorts of things people will learn in your course this summer? Sure. Um, So we will it, it's a quick hitting course. Um, and so we will just really delve into um, an introduction to public health. Um, some students come come to a public health course with 
um, a sense of not really sure of what is this thing called public health. I understand healthcare, but I'm not really familiar with public health. So we take some time to set that foundation um, to talk about the mission, the organization, the infrastructure. Um, how do you do public health? And then we delve into the science of public health, which is that term epidemiology. Again, a bit of a mouthful, but that is the, the quantitative piece. And there are whole disciplines um, in and of itself. Uh, you can get a master's degree in epidemiology. Um, we are not doing that in this course. We are going to use some of the basic skills uh, to learn how to assess the health of the community um, at a very basic level. And then um, we're going to look at these kind of examples that I've mentioned from a Manchester, from a Massachusetts, from a Vermont, um, and even just globally, how do people improve the health of their communities? And so those are kind of the three pillars of the course is to get the foundation of, of public health, to understand and practice epidemiology, and then um, to actually look at some community health assessments. And that, again, that can be on a, a local, a national or a global scale. And so that's what I'm hoping to achieve in, in the course. So um, very much uh, looking at examples from across the globe. Rosemary, you're um, a very experienced online teacher. Uh, uh, many people probably listening now have, have never taken a course online before. Can you describe mm -hmm a little bit what that looks and feels like and how sure. we that course? Sure, sure. Um, these are very different times that, that we're living in uh, as a result of, of living through a global pandemic. And um, as a result, uh, my experience to date, uh, even teaching now online, is that I think students benefit from having a very organized uh, course. So a course by which all of the expectations and all of the materials are evident and available day one. Um, so people can plan their time accordingly with family uh, obligations. And also if folks are working and working remotely, how can I also fit in taking a course remotely? Um, so I'm a firm believer in, in really having the structure of the course well-defined before the course even begins. So on day one, when students arrive to take the class, they can see what the expectations are. Um, I use a feature in my course called discussion boards, which allows students uh, to work in groups and to really take the time necessary to ponder and research some of the questions from the field. And so there's an exchange that will take place um, amongst your peers within the course and then overseen by myself. And so there's interaction with each other as well as um, with me. Uh, so very frequent interaction. Uh, we also have uh, Zoom, which we're using now for folks to see each other. So if, if folks are visual and like to actually uh, work that way, that is also an option in the course. Um, and then uh, there are weekly deliverables in the course, again, in group assignments. And then, as I mentioned, that community health assignment at the end is more of an individual. It's kind of your, your final paper, your final project in the course. And you can really pace yourself um, doing that over, over the five-week duration of our course. Uh, so there's a mixture. There's a mixture for folks who like to work in groups and a mixture for folks who prefer to work um, solo. Great, thanks. Uh, Robin, let me stop for a minute and see, are, are there questions people have or we can stop and wait for questions? Any any questions coming? There have been a couple that have come through. Um, okay. uh, one for Professor um, Carone. What are the differences in the two courses that you teach, the global health and community med medicine and epidemiology? Sure. Um, so great question. Um, I typically uh, teach an elective in this program every other year. Um, but with what's happening in the world, we figured um, community medicine and epidemiology is a very appropriate course to, to talk about. Um, I'll also mention as a side note, um, although I'm not developing specific courses around, or specific assignments, excuse me, around COVID-19, um, I will emphasize that that is going to be a running theme throughout the course um, as we are we're still living. The, the book is not written on COVID-19 yet. Um, I did not want to develop assignments around that per se, uh, but that is certainly a discussion point that will be talked about in the course. 
Um, the other elective course I teach is a uh, global uh, health, global public health course. And in that course, there's not so much emphasis on epidemiology. We're more looking at um, health status of in communities across the globe. Um, so that course is is different than the community medicine and epidemiology course. Terrific. Um, Michael, I have a question here about the online courses. Um, mm -hmm. Are they self-paced or are there going to be like, you know, sort of through, I guess, Zoom, the um, back and forth synchronous uh, right. course? You know, how does that how does that work? So the courses are primarily asynchronous, meaning that you're, as Rosemary described, you'll be given a, a, a map essentially for the entire course that shows week by week what assignments are due, what readings are due, and so you can self-pace to a, a large extent. Uh, many of the courses do have occasional face-to-face -face meetings like Rosemary described on Zoom. Uh, we also realize that some people may not be able to attend those. They're, you know, if you offer a course at a specific time, it's, you know, a very different time in the Philippines than it is in California or Massachusetts or New Hampshire. Any uh, session that's held on Zoom would also be recorded and that link would be available to people who are not able to join in person. The only other times you have to arrange um, more synchronous times is when you meet with your groups. So Rosemary described the discussion groups. The discussion groups will typically be four people uh, three, you and three of your classmates, and you would arrange a time at your own convenience to have a discussion around a particular assignment and, uh, and uh, how that's written up. Again, different instructors teach it differently. For some, discussion groups uh, are given a question and are required to come up with one response for the entire group. Mm -hmm. Determines what would go into that response, who would do a first draft, how it would be produced, Others, there's a discussion group and you discuss a particular issue and then each person might develop a short response based on that discussion. So it varies. Uh, uh, but the answer is the courses are primarily asynchronous and anything that occurs uh, in a synchronous environment uh, would be recorded so that you could see it. So it wouldn't prevent you from getting uh, anything from the course. Also, Rosemary mentioned that, that uh, all the instructors are available uh, offline through a Zoom call or through a telephone call. and Many hold what they call office hours, meaning they're available specific mm -hmm. hours during the week. So if you just want to randomly get in touch, although I think most encourage setting up an appointment uh, via an email. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think that those are all the questions I see um, in chat, so. Good. Well, thank you for joining us today. And Rosemary, thank you very much for for taking time out of your schedule to talk about uh, your work and the, the courses that you offer. And uh, we also, if we have uh, questions, um, let me see if I can put the screen back up of our, of the, uh, gives the, uh, the addresses. Uh, trying to get to the final screen uh, that we have here that has our email information on it. So that uh, people can contact us if you have any questions, and this is how you can reach us. So thanks again for, for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you.